Coming out of China, the Magin Gravat 2 has limited availability, so you're unlikely to see these in bike stores outside of China, Taiwan, or Thailand. However, Magin were keen to have one put through its paces in the Llama Lab. So today, here's all the details about the Magin Gravat 2 Direct Drive Smart Trainer here in the Llama Lab, put through its paces, what it's like, what it's all about, and an interesting way to cheat the system at the end of the video. Okay, jumping into the unit specifications here on paper and how it looks. Direct Drive Smart Trainer supporting sim mode for simulation of hills and descents, erg mode for workouts, etc. Bike compatibility, 130 and 135 quick release with through axle support, but that's not included by default. Free hub, Shimano, SRAM with a cassette not included. Supported connections, Ant Plus Power, Ant Plus FEC for training control, Bluetooth Smart, and it also has FTMS support there, so everything should be supported for connectivity. Broadcasts power and speed, but not cadence. Power accuracy is claimed plus or minus 3% with a spin down calibration option, also a zero offset option, which is the first time I've seen one of those with a direct drive trainer, and also active temperature control for the unit. Grade simulation up to 15% gradient with a rider specified at 70 kilos. Typically it's specified at 75 kilos, so give or take 15%, but that's more than enough to have fun indoors. Maximum wattage is far beyond what any of us can really do indoors. 2,500 watts at 60 kilometers an hour flywheel speed. Flywheel weight is 6.4 kilos or 14.1 pounds, so quite a weighty flywheel. 16.5 kilos of unit weight all up. Noise level is quiet with a vertically grooved belt as opposed to a horizontally grooved belt, which used to give us that whine noise from trainers. Power source is mains and it is required. You do need to plug the thing in. Firmware updates over Bluetooth if required. Price point, it's around $700 US if you can find one. Um, and it's also up to $999 US on AliExpress internationally. So it's either cheap or not, depending on where you source one of these from. There's also bundles including cassettes, Ant Plus adapters, floor mats, and through axle adapters, etc. depending on where you purchase from. So price and bundle pack may vary depending on where you're sourcing one of these trainers from. Onto the unboxing setup and getting things rolling in the Llama Lab. Everything provided here in the box from the Jean. They did provide a heart rate strap, so that doesn't come by default, but there is one in there for me to test inside the box. Okay, this has to be one of the most awkward trainers that I've come across to unbox. It is over, it's packed really well, I'll give them that. But trying to get the unit out, uh, yeah, I kind of end up giving up and uh, it, there's no handle, there's, yeah, let's just pour it out. There we go. And now there's white little bits of polystyrene everywhere. Let's get that sorted. Okay, this is a trainer review, not a vacuum review. Flywheel here, nice and smooth, very weighty and very well balanced, so I don't expect any vibrations whilst riding. Okay, here's everything that comes in the box. No cassette, as noted. We have the power pack, quick release, quick release adapters, no through axle adapters though, unfortunately, an ant stick and an ant stick extender, or a USB extension cable, and some manuals. Okay, on the back here, you'll see a cable tie hooked around a little bolt. That's the, effectively the strain gauge how it measures power. So that's come off and the way that moves is the way it measures power. I'll have a closer look at this later on and this does feature at the end of the video. But that's how it measures power. Very, very similar, or almost identical to that of the Kicker 1. Cassette goes on. I'm using an 11 speed Shimano cassette here which is compatible with my bike. Quick release because I didn't get the throw axle adapters in the box. Uh, here's me trying to decipher the manual in Chinese with Google Translate and giving up pretty quick. Okay, another closer look at the strain gauge. As mentioned, it's exactly the same design as the Kicker Gen 1. Onto the Magin utility with the iPhone. And it loads up, it gives us an ad for one lap. We hit connect here over Bluetooth and no, no, don't follow my location all the time. Uh, okay, options on the screen here. So just a very basic erg mode and a few training modes there on screen. 
but the most important one there is the firmware upgrade. So let's click on that and update from 122 to 124. This does take a few minutes. I will speed the process up for video. Happy days, we're on, we're good. We'll do a zero point calibration. I'm not sure what a zero point calibration is on the trainer, it says it's success with a negative one result. Hmm, okay, we'll look at that later. Okay, on with the old giant TCR, which is quick release, not through axle. PowerTap P1 pedals on the bike with the ZWatt Zbider. I'll be just comparing the data from the P1s though today. Okay, first pedal, and you can hardly hear the thing. That's true noise coming through there. Tire squeak on the mat's almost louder than the trainer itself. Okay, over here to the iPhone version of Zwift to make sure the Bluetooth connects up. So we have the power source, we have the control wall trainer there. Over Bluetooth, searching for cadence sensors and not happy days, no cadence sensor there for the unit. A couple of pedals or turns of the pedals to make sure things work. And that's all good there on the iPhone. This is the iPhone XS version. So that's all good there. Now over to the Llama Lab Test with Ant Plus. Connecting to the FEC trainer, FEC power source there, 58 to 489. It does have cadence listed, but it doesn't work. But we're gonna give it a crack anyway. So cadence. And as we roll out here and as we crank up the watts, we're effectively on an e-bike there with zero RPM cadence. Okay, so it is broadcasting cadence, I think over FEC, but nothing happened. So we'll go and pair. Uh, let's choose the Saris power meter for that. Cool. All right, we're rolling. Llama lab test time. And to warm things up, a pretty hard effort here up the Watopia wall. And here's an insert of the stability out of the saddle. All oh, looks pretty good. Okay, 10 minutes passed and time for a spin down. 42.84 kilometers per hour. That's very, very precise for what we need for a spin down. Once it reaches that, it does take a while to spin down. So I'm gonna speed this footage up and it's almost Done, and here we go. Okay, we are done. We're repairing everything. Back into the Llama Lab test, and I'm joined by DC Rainmaker, who was in the DCR cave testing something else himself. So he joined me for the ride here. And challenge Ray to a sprint. Not much noise coming from the unit. Still pretty stable there in the sprint. And we blew Ray's doors off. Happy days. <laughs> oh, good. I think I caught him, caught him napping a little bit there for my sprint test, but uh, we got some good data there. Then into the overs and unders, still hanging out with Ray. And the unit's holding nice and smooth there in erg mode, which is a good sign. Okay, now just a little experiment or demonstration about the external strain gauge and why these really aren't a good thing. With the help of my lovely assistant, Veronica, I'm gonna to continue to pedal at the same cadence, at the same effort as she pushes up on the strain gauge and the watts, without any extra effort from me, the watts reported from the trainer go through the roof because there's more strain being put on the strain gauge. She lets go there, it comes back down to where I'm at normally, so. Looks all good, she pushes down on the strain gauge and it reads in the negative. So same RPM, lower power. So this is the reported power being manipulated from the trainer. And again, she lets go, I go back to my true power, about 90 watts there at 90 RPM. And then she pulls up again on that. It goes through the roof without me pedaling any harder. Hmm. Okay, the Magin Gravat just stepping off there. 
after the first hour and seven minutes, 29 seconds of Llama lab test and hanging out with DC Rainmaker there as he was testing something else in the pain cave. So my initial take on the ride of this thing, just as I first stepped off, it's very, very similar to that of the Kicker and maybe even the Kicker Gen 1, given it's pretty much the same technology as the Kicker 1. It's a lot quieter with that vertically grooved belt at the back here, so no real noise. I'll cut in some video just here of the trainer. All you can hear there was just the rear gears changing. So silence, absolutely, not a problem at all there. The ride feel, that was very good. Going downhills, it really let go of the resistance and you really had to spin out and get on top of the gear. So that felt quite realistic. The sim mode changes up the hill and the erg changes from low watts to high watts were a little laggy, probably three to four seconds to really feel that full maximum change. So that could be a little bit more swifter. That was using Zwift. But other than that, a pretty good ride. Early on, it was full gas up the hill, up Watopia Wall to warm things up before the spin down calibration. Then into the Llama lab test and into that 20 minute steady state and that sprint, it really held the watts there and didn't spin out whatsoever. The sprint, pretty good. The, uh, the unit's nice and solid. That's also down to technique and how you sprint inside. You really can't reef the bike side to side like you can outdoors. It's gotta be up and down, but the unit held up didn't spin out, I managed to choose the right gear and crunch some watts out there, so that was all pretty good. So ride-wise, I'd give that about an eight out of 10, but it is, it feels like older technology though, given that little bit of lag in sim and erg mode. The power numbers coming out of the trainer itself in real time, well, three seconds average, did look pretty good side by side, but there's only one way to tell if they really were that good. Time to jump over to DC Ramekas analysis tool and compare them side by side. In what's likely to be the quickest data analysis I've ever done here on the DCR tool are, uh, oh, looks pretty good to be honest. This is the Magin Gravat 2 up against the PowerTap P1 pedals, dual sided. First 10 minutes, uh, this was uncalibrated. This was just plug in and play. That all looks pretty good. There's a few little separations here and here, but to be expected, one's measuring on the pedals, the other is measuring far down the drivetrain and into the trainer with that spinning disc. Um, yeah, it's looking pretty good. After the calibration was performed or the spin down was performed into the steady state test and the sprint, happy days, that's all good. The sprint, uh, I'll dive into the maximums in a moment, but it does overshoot in the sprints. Mm, kind of typical of the mid-range trainers that we see. So that's uh, reporting there is smooth. We'll jump down to the maximums in a moment, but it does over report in the sprints. Into the overs and unders, all looking pretty good, to be honest. Um, little bit of separation there, just a small amount. But what that does indicate is that it can hold erg mode nice and smooth. The peaks not being uh, digital, sort of a bit curved like that, indicates that it does take a little, a little bit of time for it to change those resistance uh, levels from 150 up to 350 there, and then 150 up to 450. So there's probably two, three, four seconds before it changes and stabilized. But once it does stabilize, you're not getting the big spikes and jump ups and downs we see with a few other trainers. So it's pretty good in erg. From there on though, it's a, well after the sprint I guess here, everything's out probably a few watts. So if we dive in here, there's also a green jersey sprint effort I did here, which you can see the Magin Gravat really overshooting. So it's overshooting quite a bit. So 237 versus 225. So what are we about 12 watts or so over for that average period there when I was riding along with DC Rainmaker. Um, look, I'll put that down to, that was the first 45 minutes of that trainer being used. So after the really hard, everything all out sprint, probably would have been advisable for me to stop and do a spin down from there. After the first two or three uses, you probably should do another spin down, but that's all looking pretty good to me, given the price point and how this unit measures power. Jumping down to the maximums here of the ride, and I had three sources of power. So the Gravat, the P1s, and the Zbider, which I did hide because it was, well, typically it's reading high as it does but I did get the maximums from all three units. 1391, I'm sorry, that's not me. I'm not putting out near on 1400 watts indoors. 1267 on the PowerTap P1s. Yeah, that's probably more like it. And 1265 on the Z-Watt Zbider, which reads okay for the spikes and maximum outputs. So overreading in sprints there, not too bad overall though, really. I probably should have done another spin down after that hard maximum effort of 45 minutes, but, all looking pretty good, nevertheless. 
Okay, let's look at the good and the bad of this trainer and the experience that I've had. So first of all, the good. Overall, the ride has a good ride road feel to it, if that makes sense. The 6.4 kilo flywheel really spins up and you really do get on top of the gear. And that's a super important part of indoor trainers. It needs to feel like riding a bike and there's a big tick there. This does feel like you're riding a bike. There's definitely low noise with that belt design, so there's another tick there. It's a quiet trainer. The Gravat 2 held erg mode nice and steady. You saw with the data before, there wasn't any waving, there wasn't any separation or ups. It really held that steady state zone it's really good. So for training in steady state mode with erg, happy days. The power numbers coming from the Gravat 2 were excellent, tending to good there at the end. And as I said, I probably should have done another spin down after I'd used the system for the first time. Pretty hard for 45 minutes. The protocol support for Ant Plus, FEC, Bluetooth, FTMS, tick and tick there. Everything seemed to connect and worked as expected. And a solid frame design. So it held up in a Llama Lab test sprint and didn't fall apart. So all good there. They're the goods. Now onto the bad or the not so good of this indoor trainer. It is based on a six year old plus design. That external strain gauge or that physical strain gauge that you can manipulate, that's a little bit old. And uh, anyway, you'll see at the end of this video why I really don't like that design. The resistance change lag, two to three seconds, maybe four to really get into the zone you needed to get into in ERG and SIM. Hmm, I'd really like what I'm seeing on screen to be what I'm feeling on the pedals as close as possible. Two, three, four seconds, it's too long these days. No cadence reporting from the unit. You need to use an external cadence sensor to get cadence reporting. There really should be some kind of cadence estimation there. Tax have had this sorted for ages. But similar to that of the uh, Kicker, which doesn't have cadence native, 2019, come on, we need cadence, it's pretty easy to do. No through axle adapters, support out of the box. Yeah, bow, bow. I had to use my old bike on this. No handle to move the thing. See DC Rainmaker's review over here of the Gravat 2 about uh, yeah some finger issues getting jammed in the unit. I was okay, I haven't moved the unit around, but it does need a handle. And last of all, availability. You're really not gonna be able to get one of these things outside of the countries that I've mentioned earlier in the video. Overall, this trainer would be a good buy at a very, very good price and definitely a good option for your first smart trainer if this is what you're getting into. Training-wise, it holds erg really well. It does sim mode quite well. With those lags, I'm getting a bit picky with the lagging, but it's 2019, times move on. We want better experiences out of our trainers, not something that replicates a trainer from six years ago. And when it comes to e-racing and e-sport, this trainer is a no-go, absolutely not. This cannot be trusted for reasons you'll see in just a few moments. So there it is, the Llama Lab Test, the results, and my take on the Gravat 2 Direct Drive Smart Trainer. Overall, not too bad. Not the next big thing though, to be honest. All right, if you like this video, remember to hit like, hit subscribe, leave your comments below, and hang around for a bit of fun. Okay, to finish off today's review with a little bit of fun this time, I've rigged up a little bit of a power up, so to speak, using the external strain gauge on the Gravat. As you saw earlier on there, when Veronica was pushing on the strain gauge, the older model sort of design of the trainer that I'm using today, my avatar moved forward because the watts went up because it thought there was more strain on the strain gauge when it really wasn't the case. I was just pedaling at 90 RPM. The watts went through the roof, then they came back down. What I've got set up now is, I call it my Zwift Power Up Machine, or free watts when putting the brakes on. So what I've done, you can see back here, I've wired up the bike, hooked up to the uh, strain gauge down here, onto my rear brake, and when I happen to squeeze my rear brake, I just happen to get a few extra watts. Okay, so let's say I'm riding along here at a comfortable 200 watts, 82 RPM, and uh, maybe I just need to close that gap ahead of me there. I can see B Mooney is 25 seconds up the road. So let me just put on a little bit of brake, just a little bit. And uh, let's catch B Mooney with not any extra effort at all there. So here we go. Same RPM, 400 watts, 416, 422. Do we want, oh, we're, we're doing a sprint now. Okay, 470 watts. A little bit more strain on that gauge. We're closing the gap to B Mooney. Might even be B money, but I think I'm going to be on the money with this. Oh, we closed it. Uh, we've closed it down. So there we go. Gap closed. I'll slowly release my rear brake power up and we'll return to the same power. 
So it really is as easy as that to exploit uh, the external strain gauge. So as you saw there, I closed the gap. I had a ton of extra watts because I was pulling on this, which was pulling on my little wire down here, which was pulling on the strain gauge and tricking the trainer that I was doing 600 watts plus. Well, actually, as I'm talking here, I'm doing 400, 434. But that's how easy it is to trick something like this with an external strain gauge. Anyway, today's fun with the, uh, the external strain gauge there on the power meter. Um, hmm, maybe technology that we should uh, ban for now, given how easy it is to fake those watts.